ביקשתי. dashed on every hand angry winds around it blow all on board were filled with fright at the mighty billers roll then they called up on the one who the wind and waves control when he reaches out his hand They all did say that the wind that wakes so bad. He's the one who sails with me. He's the master of the sea. Though the storms of life may rage, mighty billows round you roll. He can calm like troubled sea. of all as upon like sea you say trust in him who never fails I'm so glad he sails with me he's the master of the sea he's the one out his hand fill us he said his command waves obey his will when he says to them be still what man is this they all did say that the wind the waves obey he's the one who sails with me he's the master of the sea he's the man who sails with me Good morning, New Hope. So good to see everybody. We're doing things a little bit different this morning. Uh, so I figure since we're doing things a little bit different, we'd pray before you guys sing. So you'll sound really, really pretty. Amen. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity you've given us to come. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings you've given us. We thank you for this beautiful day. Lord, most of all, we thank you for sending your son to die on a cross so that we could have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, we ask that you would be with our service here today, Lord. Be with our praise team, be with our choir, be with our pastor as he brings the message this morning. Lord, we ask that you would... Help us, Lord, and, and your spirit would be present here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're doing things a little bit different this morning. Right now I need the kiddos to come up here. Uh, they're, they're singing with the choir. They, the choir needs help this morning. So we'll get the kiddos up. All right. Line up here. I said we were going to do things a little bit different this morning. While the rest of the kids are coming up, you guys need to stand. You'll be singing this song with the choir. Everybody's going to be singing. If you're not singing, move your lips. Put a smile on your face. Wow. Are you ready? You ready? You ready? Fist bump. Are you ready? 
Come on. Come on. Come on. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. And you're desperate for some healing. Let me tell you about
Ready? <laughs> Cause of who you are, I give you glory. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who Amen. You can be seated. It's great to have you in the house of God today. I pray uh, you have worshipped Him already this morning and you're prepared your heart for the Word of God. Uh, at this time, if you have a child, sixth grade and under, they can head toward the back and just follow the flow and they'll end up in junior church. If you're staying in the room, if you'd like to find Matthew chapter 6 this morning. Didn't them kids do good today? Always great to see them up on the pulpit area.
Praise ye the Lord. I'm so thankful it takes 10 minutes to get kids out of the room. Amen? I'm pretty sure that's the adult's fault. Kids could just fly out of here. Amen? Uh, have you had a good week? I hope so. Um, this is planet Earth, and it's full of its challenges. Amen? Uh, I come today, and as much as I hate to be, it's one of them negative days. Um, negative in the sense that we've got to take a minute um, and just allow the Word of God to teach us something about the reality of this world. I like to remind us that this book that I have at my pulpit here um, is the Word of God. We call it the Bible. Um, the way I like to say it is this is the Creator telling us the created what is true. We are born with a fallen nature. We are born sinners. We don't start sinning one day and become a sinner. We start sinning one day because we're born sinners. As I like to put it, you don't have to teach a three-year-old to lie. Can I get an amen? Anybody that's ever raised a child has looked at that little toddler and said, Did you do that? And they go, Ain't nobody taught them that. It just comes natural. And the sad part is, we don't grow out of that. We have a nature that if we don't take the Word of God, take the Creator's truth to help change us the created, we will, and boy, what an image we all get right now, as J. Vernon McGee said one time, and I've never forgot it, is any old dead piece of trash can float downstream. And boy, we're seeing it right now, huh? You go somewhere and get a good glimpse of the river right now, and on the surface of that, I don't know what all that stuff is, but I sure don't want to be playing in it. Can I get an amen? But it takes no effort to get on the, 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 the raging waters of this place called planet Earth and just float with everybody else. But it takes, as Jay Vernon said, a living fish to swim upstream. That's the essence that we begin today with. As we said last week, you've got your uh, life out there idling. It's waiting for you. You've climbed out of it, you've crawled up in here, and you've forsaken all that, and you've left it out there. I beg of you. There. I look at the young people, the teenagers sitting in this room, and I want to say, grab hold of the truth. Just grab hold of it and let it change your perspective of how you move forward in this life. And what a blessing it is to look back and see so many teenagers sitting here today. Uh, we do not take that for granted. Amen, church? God bless you for being in God's house today. If you're in Matthew chapter 6 and you're ready to read, say amen. Stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. It says in verse 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness... How great is that darkness. Last verse. No man, not a one, can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot 
serve God and mammon. You may be seated. Do you see that last phrase we read? You cannot serve God and stuff or gain or riches, possessions. You cannot serve both. I almost want to do like them shows do when they first come on. Previously on, have you heard that? Say amen. I want to go previously at New Hope. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we taught this several weeks ago. You, you cannot. It's not a you shouldn't. It's you can't. You cannot serve God and stuff. There is, if you will, a battle for your perspective. That whole light of the body is the eye. If thy eye be evil, your body's full of darkness. But if your eye is single, your life is full of light. I don't know if you've ever looked at somebody. If you were to look at me today, and I don't know if anybody noticed it or not, I'm a little heavier than normal on Sunday because I'm about to be negative and I hate being negative. I really do. I hate how negative this world is. I hate to talk about the negative, the, the, the non-positive parts of life. There's too much good to dwell on in this book to get focused on the negative of it. But as a pastor, when I'm addressing the sheep, I have to be mindful that there are warnings of pitfalls outside of the pasture. And you've got to be aware of those. And today I've come to make you aware of what the enemy would like for you to be focused on. And that is... Getting your eyes messed up. Have you ever looked at somebody and there's no light on inside of there? I got to tell you, in 2024, even in the house of God, it's hard to find somebody that looks like they have light inside of them. It's an indicator that our eye is, as Jesus put it, our perspective has lost its exclusive focus. Um, when it says you cannot serve God and, I'm just going to word it, riches. That word serve is kind of where we want to dive off. It means put your trust in. That's the idea of serve. It's amazing how when you look at words, you just read them and go, I've heard that a lot, or I've never heard that before. But you really don't stop and go, what is the Bible? What is God? What is the Creator trying to tell me as the created? What is diabolically opposed, opposed to one another is the idea of you cannot serve that stuff and him. You cannot put your trust in that and him. If you've got your trust in that stuff, your trust isn't in him. If your trust is in him, you no longer look to that stuff to find your security and your safety. You're either in the ark of God or you're out in this flood. You can't be both. Proverbs chapter 10, brother. Can you put verse 22 up? The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. We'll get to that in about three or four weeks. That I can't wait for. How the blessing of the Lord maketh rich. For the next three weeks, I feel like God wants me to take a minute and talk to us about how the blessing of the Lord does not add any sorrow with it. So if I were to title these next three messages, today it would be the sorrow of getting earthly treasures. 
Next week it will be, if God doesn't change our heart, the sorrow of keeping earthly treasures. And then three weeks from today, the sorrow of leaving earthly treasures. The only reason I'm at all excited about these three messages is if God does what God can do, I'm hoping to turn your taste buds for that world upside down. You have a natural yum-yum for that stuff. If we can somehow start thinking about the truth of what that is, maybe it will change us. Maybe. I beg of you, don't waste your time here. That world gets you six days out of the week. And honestly, it gets most of your Sunday too. Most of you, this is the only opportunity I get to see you in a whole week. And honestly, I'm up here maybe 45 minutes to an hour at the most. What a small window of opportunity for the truth to prevail against such an overwhelming dose of this filth around us. This muddy, flowing nastiness of everything around us. Wars and rumors of wars. Amen? Perversion after perversion. Everything is trying to trick you, dupe you, get into your wallet, take away your security and your peace, and we're allotting it and allowing it. Jesus came to give you life. And life to the full or abundant And yet we're letting that dark flood take us away. And I stand here begging you for a a, a few minutes of your time to just let the Creator help you. To give you life. To put some light behind them. My people is yours. That the world might go, what makes them so alive? The sorrow of getting earthly treasure because God says any riches found down here always have sorrow attached to it. If you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 3. If you know your Bible at all, you know if we go into Genesis, we're going back to where it all began The sorrow of getting earthly treasure. I don't have a lot of time to teach this because of the three points we hope to make today to help. But this is the beginning. This is when God was divvying out the curses to Adam, to Eve, and to the serpent that deceived Eve. I just want to read Adam's verse 17. If you're with me, say amen. And unto Adam God said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Notice his curse. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Here's that word. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. And notice where the sorrow will come from. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. There was a physical and a spiritual curse given to all mankind because of what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. I focus on the man because we are the ones that God has challenged us to be the leaders of the home, to be the provider of our homes. And it says to him, when you leave the Garden of Eden, a garden that was self-watered, self-maintained, it was a pleasure and a joy to take care of. When you leave here, I want to be kind enough to tell you what's facing you outside the gates of the Garden of Eden. 
First of all, this ground that has been easy to work, there has not been any thorns or thistles. There's been no weeds and no briars. When you planted seed or seed became to grow, become to go, began to come up, it was without hindrance. Everything you go to do, there will be a hindrance to it. Um, everything you try to accomplish, this earth will be fighting against it. There's an enemy in nature to everything we try to accomplish. In Henderson, when we were trying to raise a simple garden, to grow a few produce things so we could sell them at the market for our school clothes when I was a teenager growing up, the hindrance was Johnson grass. Amen. I don't know how many people know what Johnson grass is. I don't even know if that's the right name. That's what my dad called it. Therefore, that's what it is. (laughs) Amen. It is Johnson grass. The truth about Johnson grass out on Lock 11, just outside of Henderson, is is when corn that you have planted is about two inches, three inches high, you can you know all around that true corn is that Johnson grass that we didn't plant, mind you. It just came up. Can I get an amen? And here's the thing, as that precious little thing we did work hard to plant, we even put a little money in the seed, we put a little money in the gas for the gravely to till the ground, we put a little money, and I put a lot of sweat equity. I put a little sweat equity. I put as much sweat equity as Dad made me, if i got to be honest, in the house of God. Amen? It just come up, and it looked just like the corn. There is so much truth about this planet in that little analogy of you planted it, you put value in it, you're working it, but if you don't do something to help the corn... The Johnson grass will overwhelm it and you'll never get anything for your effort. The first sorrow to gain or or getting this earth's treasure is the effort it takes. Briars, uh, thistles, briars, um, you know, the Hebrew word for briars or thistles there is dar dar. I think God knows we'd be going, darn it. Amen? Can I say that from up here? Darn it? It's officially an okay Baptist word, right? I know you've said worse. Mm -hmm. And every wife said, "Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The effort. The effort. You say, Dean, does that mean there's no effort in gaining for a Christian? We'll get there in a few weeks. There is. But when all you got your mind on is what this earth gives back to you, and you're fighting the weeds and the briars, and you're fighting the sweat rolling off your face, and nothing is going right, and everything is challenging, when you don't have anything to look forward to other than what you get out of this place... That effort is overwhelming. It really is. But just so I don't spend too much time on that, I want you to go to chapter 3, verse 4. You're already in chapter 3. Go back to verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Notice, back up to verse 2. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of every fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, 
Then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Now, if the first word in the sorrow is the effort it takes to get anything out of this place, okay, the second truth is that there's this issue of natural envy in all of us, meaning I don't have enough. I don't have enough. Uh, it is as natural as a sneeze is it just comes out of us see the original sin that got us into all of this mess this cursed world was God said imagine a whole garden full of fruit trees but you can't eat of the one if you know that story say amen if you don't hang in there we'll, we'll teach you along the way this truth or you can read it for yourself Genesis chapter 3 God had put him in the Garden of Eden. It was perfect. And he said you can eat of any tree except one. In a fruit garden full of trees, full of fruit, the enemy was able to get Eve to focus her attention on the one tree she couldn't have. Amen? I've said it many times. If it was a pizza store in the middle of the Garden of Eden... I could see where Satan would say, wouldn't a pepperoni pizza sound good about now? <laughs> that makes sense to me. But how do you get somebody to get so focused on a piece of fruit in a fruit garden that they're willing to give up their literal life for it? That's how broken we are. I hate this negative stuff, but we got to talk about it. You have an insatiable, unsatisfiable urge and yearning in you that it will never be enough. We see it in our children at Christmas. As soon as they open a gift, they start looking under the tree. Where's the next one? Can I get an amen? It's just natural. Is that it? Isn't that terrible? At the end of all the Christmas gifts, some kid says, is that it? Do you know as adults, we are always saying, I need more. Amen. Remember last week, previously at New Hope, covetousness. Beware of covetousness. This is the Messiah telling people, remember the guy 50-50? God give me 50-50. And Jesus said, beware of covetousness because one person's life does not consist in the possessions that it has. Eve had it all, and Satan convinced her she didn't have enough envy. She wanted something that wasn't hers. Worse, he convinced her, listen to me, church. He convinced her, God knows in the day you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. You can't trust God. This is where, if I'm pastoring the church, I think I am. I think I have a lot of people listening to me right now that know what I know about how easily I can be convinced to not trust God. That He really doesn't have me. Therefore, we fret. Therefore, we worry. Therefore, we covet we start thinking, I don't have enough. Adam and Eve's first issue was the, the serpent convinced them that this fruit garden wasn't enough. That one tree would fulfill all their desires. Tell me we're not chasing an idea of a utopia out there that the devil's convinced us if I just get this or just get that or if I had that or man if I didn't have this my life would be full and fun and great and he's got us thinking God's being ugly to us to make us not have that or make us have to go through this and we sit there listening to that liar in our head and we start believing that junk. And we come to the house of God, not ready to praise Him for His goodness, but we sit here like half a lumps because we're mad, disappointed 
in the flood out there. Jesus wants to put us in a boat on top of all that junk. But it's not in stuff. It's in a perspective. You can't get better unless you recognize the problem. You and I deal with envy, covetousness. That's one of the sorrows that comes with laying up earthly treasures. No matter how much God has given you, there will be something in you that says, okay, that was fine when I was 20, but now that I'm 25, I should have this. And you'll look back and go, now 25, that was fine, but now I'm 30 and I should have this. And then, God forbid, you start getting to retirement and you watch a few uh, Fidelity commercials or you watch a few, uh, uh, some financial institution that says, how much do you have for retirement? And you start saying, how much do I have? Oh, no. And you get convinced you don't have enough. And your head is so stuck here. And you'll always live the rest of your life with a feeling of it's not enough. It doesn't matter how much you have. You still feel that way. It's an amazing It affected Cain. The Bible says that's why he killed Abel. Because Abel, 1 John tells us, Abel's acts were righteous. Cain's was not. And he slew him because he envied what he wasn't. Envy is a horrible disease in all of us. Uh, Can you put up Proverbs 14.30, brother? I use this. God led me to use this. When I was doing Forrest Alford's funeral. And this is the third time since that God's asked me to use this. This this verse says a lot to me. A sound heart. Literally that means a heart at peace. Is there not a one of us longing for a heart of peace? A heart that's satisfied. A heart that isn't wanting more. That you really feel like I have everything I need. Because it's exactly what God's given me. And you have this heart of peace. It's the life of the flesh. It's the light of the eyes. It's the difference maker in human conditions. I'm telling you, you can be in the hospice house. And have light in your eyes. You can. I've seen it. You can be putting all of that stuff in you knowing you're in your last weeks and still have a sense of where I'm headed is better than where I am. But envy is the rottenness of the bones. I'm telling you, envy makes us sick. Literally. Literally. Not metaphorically. Literally, envy makes us sick. It's a rottenness to our health. And I I said it at funeral and I'll say it the other time. I'm going to say it this time. Every time I think of rotten, you know what I think of? It stinks. Amen? Anything, anything I've ever touched or been around that was rotten, it had an odor that I did not want to associate with. Do you know envy in you is a rottenness? To your bones. So laying up treasures on earth. The sorrow that God says comes with it every single time. There's no exception. The effort it takes. The envy in us. That constant insatiable desire to get more. It's in all of us. That's a sorrow. Um, Lastly. uh, Proverbs 21.6 brother. The getting of treasure by a lying tongue is a vanity or an emptiness tossed to and fro of them that seek death. That's a tough verse for King James. Let me read it again. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity tossed to and fro. Anytime you hear the word in King James, tossed to and fro, the idea of no footing, the idea of no foundation, The idea of never settled. Mm. 
of them that seek death. You think they're intentionally seeking death? No. They don't think it's death. It's getting treasures by a lying tongue. If the first one was effort, the second one was envy, this one I really hope you listen to, and it's the last one, which is the favorite one in church. Amen? The last point. Uh, let me tell you something else about us. We like it easy. Can I get an amen? If anybody ever worked in a plant, if I would come and ask you, who was the laziest man that ever worked in your plant? I guarantee you, every one of you could tell me. <laughs> amen? It's just obvious. My dad always said, it seems like the laziest people come up with the best ideas because they're trying to get out of work. <laughs> amen? Invention is born out of necessity, right? And some people, their greatest necessity is, I'm tired. I ain't in the mood. Um, everybody wants it. They don't just want it. They want it to be easy. Easy. That's the only reason people get treasures by lying. Is because it gains them something that it wouldn't gain if they told the truth. 28.6, brother. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. I heard a, I heard a preacher say one time, he says, there's these people in life that they've gotten ahead in life, but it's not been climbing the ladder rung by rung. They've climbed the ladder rung by rung. People want it easy. They want life to be easy. They want everything they need so life can be easy. And when this world, the effort it takes because of the thorns and the briars to everything we're trying to accomplish, you can't just plant seed and it grow. You got to work it. You got to work it. That's the law of God. You got to work it. If you'll plant it, I'll let it grow. But you got to work it. That's our agreement. I haven't taken away, Adam and Eve, your ability to eat. I've just taken away the ease of eating. But I will bless if you'll work. But we want it easy. Therefore, we start finding ways to do it easy. We take from people. We're tickled to death to get handouts. Amen? People will play the lottery. They'll, they'll lie, cheat, steal on their taxes. Whatever it takes to get ahead easy. 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 Um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, brother. All that was Old Testament. To me, this is a... Uh, if you struggle with this... Okay, just between you and me and God, because God knows. If you know this world's got you and the treasure of it, and you're doing everything you can to get, 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 you're piling it up, stacking the cash, um, and you're convicted this morning, if you're susceptible, to every time something goes wrong, Satan easily convinces you God's mad at you. He don't like, he's keeping something from you. If you're just susceptible. Um, last week, I talked about rust and my truck. Anybody remember? My Chevrolet. <laughs> I'm not thinking about Chuck. I'm not listening to Chuck. I'm not talking to Chuck. Chuck doesn't exist right now. He left and he went, yeah, it's 40 years old. I offended our Chevrolet gentleman. Um, well, Sunday night we drove it back. Sunday night we did not drive it home. Amen. It loved church and it wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. It's the only good thing I can say about Chevrolet is it loves church. 
<laughs> I'm going to go over here. <laughs> um, when we went to leave Sunday night, it was a... <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Anybody else think I sound like a blue tick about now? <laughs> Uh, needless to say, it didn't start. Called, uh, got a toe. And uh, I got to tell you, God works in wonderful ways. Uh, the tow truck driver, uh, our son Elijah, has wrecked two cars in his life. And uh, God sent the same tow truck driver both times. Uh, if anybody knows Johnny Stapleton, uh, he's from out Mercerville way. We all know them Stapletons out there. And Johnny's just top shelf kind of guy. He's just moving 100 mile an hour. And he's always positive. For what he does, he's positive, right? It, it could have been worse. And, or, or, man, this is a nice truck. You know, I've seen some, these things last forever. If you can get this thing figured out, it'll be a good. I mean, he's sitting there telling me how wonderful I am broke down. <laughs> Amen. I'm like, man, you can find a ministry with a tow truck, right? Uh, here's what was wrong. The, the fuel pump had broken. And if anybody knows anything about a 2001 S10, the fuel pump's in the gas tank. Towed it to our local garage, the guy we have fix our stuff. And um, that was Sunday night. He called me Monday and he said, um, no, it was Tuesday. He said, you got time to stop by here? I said, this ain't good. <laughs> this is not, not, not word. He, is Johnny Stapleton available? I want to talk to him, right? I know like you. I'm going to make the story short. Uh, my fuel pump had gone out. But my bottom of my truck is so rusted out. Where they attach the, the, the gas tank to, one of the back straps, it takes two, it's so rusted out they wouldn't be able to put a strap back on it. The only chance I have of securing my gas tank is a ratchet strap. <laughs> hey, I am not a proud man, right? This, <laughs> ratchet strap that thing, right? Then he starts showing me the holes in my frame, right? And, uh, I said, I said, I always look at my doctor and say, if it was your son, what would you do, right? That's what Jennifer and I always say. You tell me I could do this or that. Tell me what you would do if it was your son. That's kind of how we logic through things. What would the doctor do if that was his son laying there? I looked at the mechanic and I said, what would you do if it was your truck? <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, it was a young buck, and he said, I'd ratchet it. <laughs> That's not it. He said, I've got a Jeep, and I've got it ratcheted, and it works. <laughs> I like the way you think, dog. Now, the real mechanic comes out. He doesn't know I've just asked him that, and he said, you might want to think about retiring this thing. Guess who I listen to? Mr. Positivity over here, right? Right? The can-do attitude, uh, it is ratcheted. Now, that's not the end of the story. They called me back, and when they took down the tank to, check, to change the fuel pump, they called back. And my gas tank is so rusted, it's got holes in the top of it and leaking out the side. I need a new gas tank. Right? I said, fix it. I believe, right? They called back. The fuel lines are rusted, and um, I'm going to need new fuel lines. And I said, fix it. At this point, I'm in too deep to get out. Can I get an amen? Um, but listen, I've got a great engine, I've got a great transmission, I've got all new brakes, because we did that last year. And now I've got a whole new fuel system, I'm telling you, I'm going to be fixing your all's vehicle. I'm going I'm to be rolling down my window and saying, you need help out there, huh? 
What year is that? Uh, 2021? Huh? You need a ride, right? I'm going to do that to Chuck, right? Right? I, I got to tell you, I am so thankful that my head and my heart is in this whole earthly treasure versus heavenly treasures. And I'm being so challenged in my study to trust God that it got me through this week. It did. I won't tell you how much it all came out to. It was half of what I paid for the truck originally. <laughs> we got this, don't we, babe? Huh? That's why I call it my motorized wheelbarrow. It's my brush hauler. And uh, I like it. I really do. This is what I don't want to be. But they that will be rich desire to be, crave to be. This is no indictment of someone who is wealthy. There is nothing wrong with being wealthy. God, God says there is a gift of the Spirit that is giving. You can't give if God hasn't given. It's okay to have wealth. I know some really good People that God's blessed. I really do. They work at this church. They make a difference at this church. And we're so thankful for them. You don't have to be rich to want to be rich. They that will be rich. They crave it. They long for it. It isn't that they can have this huge amount of money. They're trusting it. It's where their faith is. That is what will get me through this life. You cannot serve God and rich. You can't do it. You're, you're putting your trust in one or the other. And what this is, is people who think this is what brings life. That's the issue. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. They fall into it. And into many foolish, senseless hurts and lust, which drowned men in destruction and perdition. Perdition, a word you don't hear every day, means irrevocable ruin. Irrevocable. You can't fix it. Isn't it interesting, we've been talking about this river, and here we're talking about the word drown. There's a few horrible ways to die on this planet in my mind. To me, drowning would be one of them. Next to being burned, drowning would be next for me, I think. The idea of wanting to live, fighting to live, and losing that battle. And there's at a point where you recognize, I am losing that battle. It's a fighting for your life. When I think of drowning, that's what I see. I see fighting for your life. And this is the life of someone who will be rich. That toss to and fro. The issue with drowning is, you have nothing under to catch you. You're swimming in it. And you're still drowning. Metaphors galore. Can you own that? That if you would be honest about the whole economy of this life, isn't that kind of a great concept of it's like this? Every time you turn around, it seems like you're just hanging on for dear life or you're trying to get your footing and you can't. And... If it can get worse, the next verse does. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which while some covet after, that envy, that it's never enough, they have erred, erred from the faith. Gold 
has grown larger than God. It's replaced him. He's, it's become what you serve and not him. And pierce themselves through with many, there's our word of the day, sorrows. Um, last thing I'm going to do today is read out of this book again. I've read this numerous times. Every time I read it, every time I read it, it does the same thing to me. It's called the essay. It says, there were once two men, both seriously ill, in the same small room of a great hospital. If you're with me, say amen. Quite a small room, just large enough for the pair of them. Two beds, two bedside lockers, a door opening on the hall, and one window looking out over the world. Do me a favor. Find yourself in this today. One of the men, as part of his treatment, was allowed to sit up in bed for an hour in the afternoon. Had something to do with draining the fluid from his lungs. And his bed was next to the window. But the other man had to spend all of his time flat on his back. And both of them had to keep quiet and still. Which was the reason they were in the small room by themselves. They were grateful for peace and privacy. None of that bustle and clatter and prying eyes of the general ward for them. Of course, one of the disadvantages of their condition was that they weren't allowed much to do. No reading, no radio, certainly no television. They just had to keep quiet and still. Just the two of them. They used to talk for hours and hours about their wives, their children, their homes, their former jobs, their hobbies, their childhood, what they did during the war, where they had been on vacation, all that sort of thing. Every afternoon, when the man next to the in the bed next to the window was propped up for his hour, he would pass the time by describing what he could see outside. And the other man began to live for those hours. The window apparently overlooked a park with a lake where there were ducks and swans, children throwing them bread and sailing model boats, and young lovers walking hand in hand beneath the trees. And there were flowers and stretches of grass and games of softball, people taking their ease in the sunshine. And right at the back, behind the fringe of the trees, was a fine view of the city skyline. The man on his back would listen to all of this, enjoying every minute how a child nearly fell into the lake, how beautiful girls were in their summer dresses, and then an exciting ball game, or a boy playing with his puppy. It got to the place that he could almost see what was happening outside. Then one afternoon, when there was some sort of parade, the thought struck him. Why should that man next to the window have all the pleasure of seeing what's going on? Why shouldn't I get the chance? He felt ashamed and tried not to think like that. But the more he tried, the worse he wanted the change. He'd do anything. In a few days, he had turned sour. He should be by the window. And he brooded, couldn't even sleep, and grew even more seriously ill, which none of the doctors understood. One night, as he stared at the ceiling, the man by the window suddenly woke up coughing and choking, the fluid congesting in his lungs, his hands groping for the button that would bring the night nurse running. But the other man watched without moving. The coughing racked the darkness on and on, choked off, then stopped. The man continued to stare at the ceiling. In the morning, the day nurse came in with water for their baths and found the other man 
dead. They took away his body quietly with no fuss. As soon as it seemed decent, the man asked if he could be moved to the bed next to the window. They moved him, tucked him in, made him quite comfortable, and left him alone to be quiet and still. Last paragraph. The minute they'd gone, he propped himself up on one elbow painfully and laboriously and looked out the window. It faced a blank wall. I don't know what it is about that that gets me every time other than it seems like the word truth just jumps off the page at me. Whatever we envy, whatever our Heavenly Father hasn't given us that we wish we had, or anything the Heavenly Father has given us, we wish He would take away. Either way, if He could allow us to get up on an elbow and get a real look at the life we think it would give us, we would find out the life we have is the best life. We take our blessings for granted and we get caught up in that flood when God says, I've got you. I hate being negative, but that world has nothing but sorrow attached to every treasure it's trying to give you. You say, preacher, if I believe you, what do I need to do today? Just say, God, keep me faithful for the next few weeks. God, keep teaching me what you need me to learn. And God, help me to learn to put my trust in you and nothing else. God, as I come to you now, I thank you for your love of us. I thank you for the gift of church and the idea of coming together as a group, binded together to grow together, to encourage one another. And God, may we all be encouraged today together that we can trust you. We don't need a bite out of that apple out there that you've told us to stay away from. You have plenty of apples for us in this life. God, teach us to trust you. Teach us that you will never ever leave us or forsake us. That we can trust you no matter what the circumstances of our life are. So we can know what it is to have peace. God, please give us peace today. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Can I ask you honestly, wouldn't you love to trust the Lord? Wouldn't you love to stop fretting about that flood out there? And just trust that He knows every step of your journey and everything you'll need. And He'll get you home with just enough. Don't you? Instead of having a big invitation where we all sing and we open up the altars. I'm just going to, it's one of them Sundays, I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes and talk to the Lord about what He's talking to you about. Before you leave and you go start your life back up. Just don't leave here without doing a little bit of business with the God of heaven. If you're his child, talk to him. If you're not God's child, if you've never become a Christian, start talking to him about where you are, your struggles with him, your doubts of him, why you struggle with faith. He's not fragile. He knows everything about you, everywhere you've been, everything you've done. He's ready to have a relationship with you. Just talk to him about why you can't just yet have a relationship with him. But if it is a day that you want to begin a relationship with him, Jennifer and I will be out under the canopy. Just come up to us today and say, I'd love to talk to you about that. And we'll find us a quiet place to go talk about giving your heart to Christ. For just a few minutes, let's all just take a minute before we go start our lives back up and talk to God about this life of ours.
they're still praying, you go right ahead. Um, if you're done, you can look up. I just need to give you a few announcements today. Uh, first of all, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, uh, we are having a VBS meeting. Our first and maybe our only one as a whole group. Um, if you would like to be a part of our VBS uh, in the sense of helping with it, uh, to learn more about it, uh, the idea is go get something for lunch, come back at 1, and, and uh, I would like to think we'll be here no more than an hour, if that. Uh, just take, talking through some of the changes we think God wants us to make this year, just so everybody's aware, we would love to have you. By the way, our Bible school is July 21st through the 25th this year, Sunday through Thursday. We do have an adult class for any adults. I call it a casual revival we just come in, have a meal, and then we come in and have us a little uh, sermon and uh, grow that week. Um, if you want to mark that down in your calendars. Next Sunday's Good News Club Sunday. Uh, Miss Terry and all those that work for the Good News Club has invited three different schools that have Good News Club to come. And those kids come and their families. And they're going to get up and minister to us for 15 or 20 minutes or so and uh, be a part of our service. So we want to support them. We're going to have a lunch for them afterwards. Uh, anybody like to encourage those families and welcome them, feel free to come back there and be a part of that right after the morning service as well. Uh, if you think you're going to stay and do that, um, maybe let Miss Julie or Jennifer and I know, um, and that way we can kind of figure out how much food to plan for. Tonight we start something brand new in the adult class, adult church, uh, over in the fellowship hall on Sunday nights at 6. Uh, we're going to start learning about uh, becoming spiritually minded. The Bible says to be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally or fleshly minded is death. And we're going to start talking about that on Sunday evenings. We have something choir practice. Anybody like to be in the choir can come at six. We have classes. We've got a teen group out in the teen room. Brother Jimmy and Erica lead that for our church. We have kids programs for all ages. If you'd like to come back tonight, we'd love to have you. Pray for Aaron and Evelyn. Great to see Miss Evelyn here today. Um, she's still back there. I can't see her. Miss Evelyn. Yay. Um, let's keep praying for Aaron and Evelyn. Denver and Janet need our prayers. Brother Tim was in the hospital for a night this week, still having his heart issues. Continue to lift Brother Tim up that what they, they're trying now will work. Uh, Tim and Jill, they're going through this together. Uh, Linda and Elizabeth Tucker we're praying for. Robert Holly, the Remy family. Israel, church, we better be praying. Amen. We had better be praying. Our military, our elections coming up in November, and these young couples that are getting married in May, let's keep lifting them up. Let's all stand. Thank you for being here today. I pray God blesses you for it. Um, Brother Ronnie Kermines, will you dismiss us, brother?